Welcome to the Janine Boland Show, where we share tips from around the globe as we guide practical people with their finances using money tips, increase their incomes through side businesses, and maintain their sanity by staying in their creative zone. Hello, welcome to the Janine Boland Show, and today I have with me Todd Churches, who is the author of Visual Leadership and is the co-founder of A Big Blue Gumball. He's the innovative New York City-based leadership development and executing coaching firm. He's also a member of Marshall Goldsmith's MG100 Coaches and the founding partner of the Global Institute for Thought Leadership. I just wanted to let you know we are in good hands today as we discuss his book, Visual Leadership, Leveraging the Power of Visual Thinking in Leadership and in Life. And what's amazing about this book is that it is rich, it is dense, and it is worth the price for that hardcover copy. I want to encourage you to get the hardcover copy because there is so much in this book. It's a classic you'll be referring to over and over again. Now, we are only going to be discussing one chapter in Todd's book today. It is the Pizza Slice Approach to Difficult Conversations. Thank you so much for being with us today, Todd. Thank you, Janine. You said it was dense and rich. You didn't say it was colorful and fun. So I just want to make sure that people knew about that as well. Uh, one of the comments, my, one of my favorite comments about the book was that someone said, I've never read a business book that made me smile and laugh so much. So that was one of my favorite compliments about the book, because it is meant to be entertaining as well as educational. And it is all of that. It is fun. And one of the reasons I like to say the words, it's rich, it's dense, is because there are so many books that you can get on Amazon today that solve a single problem, right? I mean, a lot of quality people are writing these wonderful 100-page books that strip out all of the uh, detritus and a lot of the fluff that you have in a lot of business books. And yet with Todd's, I was pleasantly surprised. The storytelling isn't extreme. It is appropriate. And It does make you laugh and it's fun to look at because he printed this book in color. And so ladies and gentlemen, when you print in color, let me tell you, you pay out through the nose as an author to have uh, something in color and you do everywhere. There's these beautiful colored images and diagrams. So yes, very rich, very uh, texturally fun. So anyway, I I had to put my money where my mouth was when it came to the color printing and it was, uh, I'm glad I did. I'm glad you did too. I love seeing it. So for for starters though, let's talk about, you know, when it comes to coaching clients, a lot of times you may have to have a pretty difficult conversation that you're going to get ready to launch into with them and they may not want to hear much about it. And so what I'd love to hear from you is you have these seven P's that you go through. And for those of you who have Todd's book, it's on page 102 and 103. I highly recommend you read this. You have preparation, person, points, purpose, plan, practice, and perspective. So if you don't mind, let's go ahead and get started on you describing for us the different aspects of the seven P's. Sure. But before I do, just one other P is the pizza slice. So coming from New York, pizza is one of our core values, as you know. So um, and some people can tell just from my accent that I, I grew up in and still live in New York City. So the pizza slice approach, if you picture a pizza slice, this triangle, the pepperonis, and each pepperoni is a person in your organization. So put yourself as the center pepperoni, that's you. And then above you, it would be your manager or any senior leaders, or if you're the senior person in your own company, that's you. And then who's around you, right? Who are the, who are your peers, who are your your external colleagues or vendors, and then anyone who reports to you. So that's the idea behind the pizza slice is most organizational charts are like these huge structures, but I want to simplify it. Picture a slice of pizza with you at the center, and then we'll take it from there. So in terms of the seven Ps, that's the approach that we take to prepare for a difficult conversation. We all stress out about conversations, whether it's with a spouse or a child or a vendor or a colleague. But if we're prepared and if we do these seven Ps, it takes a lot of the stress and worry out of the conversation. So um, the first P, as you mentioned, is preparation. We have to do our homework. We have to think about, do we have our information correct? Uh, Do we have the data? Do we have the story? So often we jump to conclusions without having the full story. We go about based on hearsay or rumor or sometimes something will happen once and we magnify it as if it has happened a thousand times, right? Um, We need to keep things in perspective and proportion by focus on the information at hand, right? So that's where we have to do our homework. That's number one is preparation. 
Number two is person. Who is the person, the individual you're going to have this conversation with? What is their mindset? What was their involvement? What was their, is their style? What is their status? What is their relationship to you? What is your prior history? How receptive are they going to be? Are they going to be like, no, I disagree? Or are they going to be like, yeah, you're right. I need, we need to fix this, right? So you, we need to anticipate what is the reaction or response going to be. So that's number two. The third P is what are the key points you want to make? What are your key messages, right? So often we want to talk about 100 things. People can't grasp 100 things. And how are we supposed to pre prepare to talk about 100 things, right? So what are the key points? In one order, do you want to make those points, right? So this is about, again, part of the preparation is preparing in general, doing your homework, thinking about the person, and then what are your messages? What are the key points you want to make and in what order? So stopping right there for a second, any thoughts or comments before I jump into the, the next P? Okay. Thanks so much. Because see, one of the things I absolutely love about Todd is he's not only an academic professor, so he's used to just like, okay, I have 45 minutes to get all this information into your heads. Everybody start taking notes. Here we go. Launch. And he just goes off. <laughs> and it's great. And that's what I love because it's very rich in its information. So one of the things that a lot of us do is with Zoom and that sort of thing is we don't feel we need to prepare sometimes. Sometimes we're so used to Zoom being kind of informal or people can't see what I'm doing that they don't make the necessary um, appropriate uh, preparations for what they're wanting to ask people. So when it comes to difficult conversations, what are some questions or recommendations some of your students have had about how do I figure out what points I'm trying to make without coming off as uh, more aggressive? Then I want to. Do you have some suggestions? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we need to do in any conversation is put ourselves in the shoes of the other person. Use empathy, compassion. Um, Elvis Costello, one of uh, my favorite songs of his is called What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding, right? So if you think about peace, love, and understanding in this conversation, how can I keep the peace, right? How am I going to have a conversation that's civil? And even if the person is defensive or whatever, we want this to be a peaceful conversation. We want to do it with love love and caring, right? If you're a manager, if you're giving someone feedback or you're dealing with a customer or whoever, if we do it with caring and empathy um, and compassion, it's going to be a better conversation. And understanding is about seeing things from the other point, person's point of view. On the cover of my book is a rainbow color of the eye. And one of my principles is to flip the eye, look at things from the other person's lens, right? Put it, and say, if I was receiving this message, how would I feel? What would I be thinking? How would I be responding? And if you do that, you're going to have a much better conversation. And I thank you for bringing that up because in this day and age, it's really, you have so much thrown at you from other people's perspective that sometimes we get defensive before we ever get on a Zoom call because of all the messages we're having slammed into our own head. So taking that moment to go, okay, I want to have this very difficult conversation. Let me try to see it from somebody else's eyes. Peace, love, and understanding. I love that one. <laughs> thank you for reminding us of that. So go ahead and lead us then on to uh, the next several points. We started uh, point four was purpose. Right. So once you prepared, thought about the person and identified your key points, remember, you still haven't had the conversation yet. This is all in the preparation phase. Then it's like, what's your purpose? What is your intent? Stephen Covey in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People said, begin with the end in mind, right? So if you start with that, what is your purpose? What do you want the outcome of this conversation to be? Are you just trying to lash out or do you have some kind of objective that you're trying to achieve? Is there a problem you're trying to fix? So if we don't start with that, then we don't know where, where, where we're going to end up or even why we're having this conversation. So I just wanted to mention, since you brought up Stephen Covey, that's the only huh. reason I'm speaking right now, love his stuff, love what he's done. But just for the listeners out there, I wanted to let you guys know that his son, Sean Covey, has the seven habits of highly effective teens. Now, as a professor myself and being in academic institutions, what have you, for people under the age of 99, you may want to read that book because the the, it is a wonderful guide on how to help you move through your life if you're dealing with emotional trauma from a previous experience. So um, as much as I love Stephen, I know he's the one that created it, but his book is kind of a yawn. And since the, yeah. it's a yawn, because he had to write it when he did, right? Back in the 90s when he brought it out. But because we are talking about visual leadership, you want to take a look at Sean Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens, because it flows perfectly with the 
mindset that Todd is giving us today with this conversation. So thanks you for letting me butt in on yours. Let's go to step five plan. Sure. I love any book recommendations, right? We, this, if this time is so short and yet there's so, so, you know, so much to read, so little time. So every recommendation is an important and valuable one. So, so step five is plan, right? You've thought about the person and the preparation and the points and your purpose. Now, when and where and how are you going to have this conversation, right? Do you, Here's a perfect example. One time I was packed, I was in my office, packed, leaving the catch-up plane to go on vacation, and I said goodbye to my boss saying, I'll see you next week. He said, oh, I need to talk to you about something, a project for you to work on when you get back. I'm literally, my head was checked out, my bags were packed. Was that the right time to have that conversation or to give me feedback on something? Definitely not. So you want to think about when and where and how are you going to have this conversation? Because you want to set the conversation up for success. And if you don't plan for the when and the where and the how, it's most likely not going to be successful. Step six, again, before having this conversation, is practice. Whether it's on paper, in your head, in front of a mirror, in front of your dog, whatever it is, role play this conversation in your head. Envision how it's going to be received. Envision the words. You wouldn't get up on stage and do a TED Talk without doing preparation, right? So why would you get up and have a really important perhaps difficult conversation with someone without practicing it. So you could practice with a spouse. You, you know, again, you need to keep things confidential, but if you practice, you can envision, this is the, where the visual thinking factors, and you can actually picture the conversation in your mind's eye and, and envision how it's going to go. Lastly, number seven is perspective. One thing I'd say is, Think about how this conversation is going to go from the other person's point of view. Are they going to expect it? Is this going to come out of left field? Um, on a scale of one to 10, do you think this person is going to react to it like a 10? This was a great conversation. Glad you brought this up. Or is this going to be like a one or a zero? Like, all right, this is a nightmare, right? So you want to think about, th th as the saying goes, um, prepare for the best. Expect, you know, prepare for the worst, but expect the best. So if you've done all the other steps, you have increased your likelihood of having a successful conversation. Cervantes, who wrote uh, Man of La Mancha, actually uh, Don Quixote, said to be prepared is half the victory. So if you prepare, you're halfway to a successful conversation. So I'm gonna stop right there. Those are the seven uh, Ps. And again, if you do these things, you're most likely to, Im to improve your odds of having a very successful and productive conversation. You know me, I love to take things to extreme because that's where we can see where a system breaks, okay? And because I was in automation and systemology and yeah. that sort of thing, it's like I always test something until it breaks to say, okay, that's going to be the first problem. So let's move forward with making that a little bit stronger and then we'll worry about the rest of the machine. So one of the things that I love about this is if you don't mind, share with us uh, examples of uh, a case, a scale of one and a scale of 10 type of conversations kind of walk us through it. So most people are like, okay, so I need to stop working with this particular person and I need to fire them if they're a business person or there are times in your life and some people will say, well, I don't own a business. I, I don't have to say goodbye to anybody. And I'm like, yes, you do. There are times where, you know, you have somebody that you've hired to take care of your house or something like that. And you need to fire that person and you need to let them know why you don't want to just ghost them every time they call you or what have you. So there is, that's the one, you know, some people said, Oh, what about divorce? I'm like, that's a little extreme. Let's, mm. let's go with a different type of months. And then a conversation 10, how do you handle preparing for that aspect? So if you wouldn't mind walking us through your extremes. Yeah, again, if it's one is the worst and 10 is the best, you, know, you want the best possible outcome. And again, if you do these steps, you're increasing your likelihood. However, the other person may not be receptive. They may not be responsive. They may think that they did a great job and you think that they didn't. Or you may say, you know, what? I need to let this person go. And, you know, one of the things we say in the management leadership field is if when you give someone a performance review or give them feedback, if it's the first time they're hearing it, then you really haven't done a, a great job of communicating along the way because you haven't been giving some people incremental, incremental feedback along the way. It should never be a total shock to someone. Just like a student, if they get an F at the end of the course and they like thought they were going to get an A, Whose fault is that as the professor, the fact that you gave them no feedback or guidance or, or indicators along the way? So a conversation that's a one is, a one is one where it backfires on you. The, it gets explosive. It gets defensive. It gets you know, um, very heated. 
Um, not that it's going to come to blows, although I've seen things like that happen. But it's really when you attack the person as opposed to the problem. And there's that saying that separate the person from the problem. It's not you're a bad person. It's what you did didn't work out or could have gone better or it was a complete nightmare or a disaster. But you want to think about in proportion and perspective, how did that situation go? On another hand, you know, this conversation that's a 10 is one where the person acknowledged it, said, yes, I, they accept responsibility, they acknowledge that things didn't go so well, and say, let's, let's, how can I fix it? Let's have this, uh, make this a dialogue, right? A lot of times, think about it, is this going to be a monologue or a dialogue? Is it going to be all you talking and the other person just sitting there with their arms crossed and then storm out of the room? Or is it, hey, let's talk this out. Let's have a, a decent, civil, candid conversation. And one of the other models in my book that often comes up, and it's controversial, is the feedback sandwich approach, where you start with a positive, then give the constructive, and then end on a positive note. I just want to preface this by saying that feedback sandwich model is so powerful and effective when used in the right time and place and situation, situation and person. It is not a one-size-fits-all model. And it doesn't it's not flattery and then slamming the person. It's like, Janine, I love that blue shirt you're wearing today and those blue headsets. I love how it matches. By the way, you're the worst podcaster I've ever seen in my entire life, and I regret being on this show, And uh, <laughs> but good luck with everything, and I'll see you in the future, right? That is not what the feedback sandwich is supposed to be, right? right. It's supposed to be, Janine, you did all of these things so well. One thing that might be done even better is if you did this, this, and this, but I know you could do that, and I have full confidence in you because I've seen you done similar things in the past, you be you were great this time. You'd be even more amazing next time. How would that feedback feel? It'd be like, oh, great, I, I did all these things well. So one one of the Dale Carnegie principles. And I was a Dale Carnegie trainer earlier in my career, and I love speaking of classic books, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Very dated, written in 1936, but its principles are as timely and timeless as ever. Um, he said, make the fault seem easy to correct. Right? Acknowledge the positive. Start with um, start with what is good. Unless someone's really a disaster, you can always find something positive, even if it was just their effort. They tried, right? It could have completely bombed and failed, but they tried their best, right? So if we acknowledge that, I know you tried your best. This didn't work out. Let's talk about how we can fix it going forward. Let's see how we can maintain. You want to maintain the relationship, basically. You don't want to destroy it and say things that can never be taken back. And the bottom bond of the feedback sandwich is ending on a positive note, because anytime we get negative feedback, it makes us feel bad about ourselves. So you want to build up the person's morale by saying, hey, I know you could do this. So it's like, hey, I, I appreciate these things. Here's an area of improvement. And if you could do this, you'll be even better in the future. So that's the way of sandwiching your feedback. So that's a technique you could use to deliver a message when you're having one of these difficult conversations. Now you actually have to have the conversation. So one of the things that people don't think about is how am I going to open, right? Opens and closes are so important, whether it's a poem, a song, a movie, a novel. We need to focus on opens and closes. So what's the very first thing you're going to say? If you start out with like this conversation with your editor, if you start out with some small talk, hey, how's the family? How's this? How's your weekend? Oh, by the way, you're about to, you, I'm firing you. It would be like that would not be either <laughs> appropriate or well well done, right? So oh, you want to no. think about so so you want to think about how am I going to initiate? Is it a hey we need to talk or um, you know, so whatever the opening sentence is, we want to really be clear about our intent and what the impact is going to be because um, that's that's where things start, right? So then you want to think about what am I going to say and not say? You may have so much to say, you may have a hundred complaints, but if you've already made the decision to let this person go. You don't have to give them a list of 100 things that they did wrong. You may just say, this isn't working out, or and this is whether breaking up a relationship, or you don't have to go through the whole litany of why I'm, I'm ending this you know, relationship of here's the 1,000 things you did wrong over the last five years we've been together. Um, but it's, it's just saying, you know, we need to have a serious conversation. Um, also, have examples, right? What examples are you going to use, or anecdotes, or stories? So if you just say things factually, that's fine, but again, it's from your perspective. So you may want to give someone an example of, you know, this isn't working out. Here's an example. I asked you to do this. You didn't do this. Now, one of my mantras, and I mentioned this in my book a couple of times, is that people are not mind readers, right? If you say you should have done this or you should have known, anytime people you know, use the word should or just, why didn't you just do this? If it was that easy, I would have done it, right? Or if I thought of it. So what, be careful when we're using words like should or just because we're making assumptions that the person 
person can read our mind and knew exactly what we wanted and needed. Sometimes it's our fault, right? There's that contributory negligence that goes into someone making mistakes. But if you have specific examples, that really brings it to life. And the person say, yes. So then the key is, do they acknowledge it and say, yes, that was my fault. I did that wrong or whatever. Or is it like, you're the one who's wrong. You didn't tell, you didn't explain it properly. So how are they going to respond and react? Then you're going to have to close at some point, right? Otherwise, you could talk for 12 hours. So you want to think about how am I going to wrap up and close this conversation? But you want to start, again, beginning with the end in mind. What do you want the other person to think, feel, know, and do at the end of the conversation, right? You want them to think in a different way and look at things from your perspective. You don't want them to feel bad necessarily, but you want them to feel accountable or feel that they get what you're talking about. What do you want them to know? Maybe they didn't realize before everything that you just said, but ultimately what do you want them to do? If you're getting rid of someone, you've already made that decision, what you want them to do is to resign or to say, I get it, I'm fine with it. I respect your opinion or decision, and you want to leave things. You never want to burn bridges either on either end, right, if, if you're separating. So you want to leave things on as positive a note as possible. Otherwise, you wouldn't recommend this person, right, if she stormed out or was volatile or whatever. So you want to think clearly about how do you want this to end? Just as you know, Have you ever watched a movie that was great, and then the ending was just awful, and the credits rolled, and you're like, wait, what? I just spent three hours for, on what, right? So same thing with the conversation. You don't ever want a conversation to end with what just happened here right? You want to visualize in your mind's eye how you'd like it to go. Now, it doesn't always go that way, but at least you can make adjustments along the way to hopefully get it to the resolution that you're striving for. And thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it because I did not want to burn bridges with my editor. I liked this person and she helped me with so many of my books. So, you know, I've written uh, now I'm up to book number 11. I've gone through three different publishers. I have gone through four different editors. And when I found this particular editor, it was very ecstatic. But it's obvious that some, like, what did they say? Some people are in our um, life for a reason, a season, or they're in it for life. Mm -hmm. And I knew, ah, this was a seasonal relationship. I, of course, would love to have an editor that stuck with me for life <laughs> because it gets real short, but that's not always the case. So thank you for helping us uh, sure. kind of wrap that up and close. Are there any additional thoughts you want to talk about as far as how to go about moving into a difficult conversation or kind of wrap it, this up for this section? Well, I one of the things to think about is think about difficult conversations that you've been in where you were on the receiving end, right? Visualize those, picture those from your past. And that way you can do a better job of delivering a conversation by learning from the experience of others and from what it's like to be on that end of things. So often um, we don't put ourselves in the shoes of the other person um, and we don't talk, talk to someone else also. If you're gonna have a difficult conversation, Talk to someone that you know and you trust in confidentiality and say, I need to have this difficult conversation. Can I talk this out with you? Can I role play this with you? Um, do you have a, step, a process that you know of like these seven Ps that will help me to formulate my thoughts and how am I going to have this conversation? So all of these things will help. Anytime we have a difficult situation, we always feel it's very common, especially if you're so, a solopreneur, to feel isolated and alone. There's always someone out there who's gone through something similar who can be a sounding board, a mentor, or to help guide you through this. So um, I think that's an important thing, too, for those of us who run our own businesses is to talk to other people like Janine uh, and say, Janine, what would, have you ever faced this before? What would you recommend uh, someone that you trust and whose opinion you value? And that will help to set you up for success as well. So, Todd, if somebody wants to learn more about you or buy your book, where should they go? Sure. Well, firstly, uh, my website is toddchurches.com. So there you can find my TED Talk and you can find other information about me and what I do. Uh, secondly, feel free to link in with me. Just say you saw me on Janine's show or heard me on Janine's show. Link in with me. and I'm happy to continue the conversation. Or uh, my book, Visual Leadership, is available anywhere books are sold, including Amazon and uh, your local, hopefully your, your, no, your local neighborhood bookstore. And if they don't have it, Feel free to request it. We'll see if we can get into more bookstores. Thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate you giving time and giving us a wonderful uh, system to handle those difficult conversations. Thank you, Janine. Always great talking to you. And so that was Visual Leadership, Leveraging the Power of Visual Thinking in Leadership and in Life, Todd Churches. And you want to spell his last name as C-H-E-R-C-H-E-S so that you don't be like me. Janine was typing in churches with a U, 
doesn't work. It's an E. You want C-H-E-R-C-H-E-S. Go to his website. I recommend you go to his website and order his book from there because what's wonderful is you get an opportunity to have a download of the 52 books that Todd recommends that you read. And as an avid scholar myself, I always love it when people let me into their head through the books that they read. So stay tuned with us. You know, the Janine Boland show always operates on Sunday at noon. We love being able to see you and be sure to tune in next week when we have yet more guests and more information to help you live the high quality life that you want for yourself. We'll see you soon. For joining us here on the Janine Boland Show, and it is the season of Thanksgiving, and we are getting ready to launch into all kinds of things with Black Friday and coming around and enjoying family and friends, hopefully, or avoiding family and friends, depending upon what you are doing. But one of the things I know is so much fun during this time of year is being able to to give back. We have a lot to be grateful for. If you're listening to this show, you are surviving a world pandemic. Congratulations. You are a survivor. I want you to pat yourself on the back. And also, I'd like you to get to know a very dear friend of mine by the name of Richard Ryman and how he is the organizer. He founded a nonprofit in 2019 called Imagination Video Books. And you know, I'm an author of 12 books. I'm very excited anytime I see somebody doing something different, unique, and amazing when it comes to helping literacy in our world. And what uh, Richard has done is he is filling the gap that exists for over 350,000 visually and hearing impaired young children in the U.S. who cannot fully experience those beautifully illustrated books that children's books are so well known for. Imagination Video Books has a channel on the described and captioned media program, which provides free access to teacher tools and accessible educational videos and TV shows for families and educators with at least one student who has a disability. Thank you so much for being on the show with us today, Richard. Janine, it's great to be here with you. It's always so much fun because I remember when I first met you, it was always so much fun to hand a microphone to you because you would drop your voice by two octaves and go, hello. (laughs) (laughs) And we love that. We love that. (laughs) And, and, And I'm known because I'm an audiobook narrator and producer uh, as, as the audiobook wizard, you know, from uh, right from Harry Potter. Well, Harry, so good to see you, Harry. You know, I gave your parents their wands. <laughs> yes, so that's the audiobook wizard in me. It's, and we love that. And that's why we would always hand Richard the microphone and go, Richard, say something. <laughs> it was always so much fun. But you created this nonprofit organization and you said your mission is to reinforce children's core values, such as kindness, empowerment, through the creative force of children's book authors, illustrators, publishers, and narrators. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, what got you so inspired to drive in this direction? Well. I always loved reading to my children, and children's picture books are just so wonderful at a time in their lives. They can learn about so many things and spark their imagination, thus the imagination video books. And when I became an audiobook narrator, I noticed a gap in the audiobook world. Uh, Blind children and low-vision children didn't start with audio, with books until they were chapter books in audiobooks because picture books don't make great audiobooks without the pictures. Well, audio description has come along uh, for film, movie for movies and, and TV shows and theater uh, where the images are described. And I thought, why not combine these things so that all children can experience the pictures in picture books. And that's why we, uh, we started out with targeting uh, blind and low vision children and have actually expanded it to add uh, videos with captions 
and simultaneous American Sign Language for deaf and low hearing children to learn ASL, help them learn ASL at a time that's critical in their development. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful project. I'm working with over 100 volunteer narrators, including 12 who are visually impaired themselves. Our audiobook producer is totally blind, uh, uh, Chris Snyder, and, and he does a wonderful job. And, you know, it just thrills me every day to be able to do this. One of those things that when you see this niche that needs to be filled and then all of a sudden you have all these people saying, sign me up, sign me up. I'll be glad to help you out with that. So talk to us a little bit. When you first started, you had your granddaughter with you. Wasn't she one of your very first narrators? You know, it was very much a family kind of produced thing. <laughs> Well, it's it's actually my daughter. Oh, your uh, daughter. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, this I'm is Janine old, I know. pulling. No, this is Janine <laughs> pulling the shoe leather out of her mouth again. <laughs> yes, yes. I eat crow a lot. Anyway, please continue. Your yes. beautiful daughter. My, my beautiful young daughter, Erin, is also an audiobook narrator. I call her the real talent of the family. She narrates <laughs> a lot of the children's books because she can do young voices. She can do mothers and grandmothers and, and, and all sorts of, uh, of, of things and has narrated uh, for HarperCollins. Uh, so she's uh, in the big leagues. And uh, my son, Sean, has done some of the audio editing, too. So, yes, it's kind of a family project. And that's what how I got introduced to you. Uh, you and I were at a conference together. And what was really wonderful is as soon as people found out that this was a nonprofit, it was amazing how people were like digging, digging deep to get you going. Because uh, at the time, there was something like you had only been able to do something like eight or 10 books. I, I can't quite remember. And how many books have you guys been able to produce up to this point? Uh, we are up to 75 books. Uh, and we've only been doing this for, uh, we started in January. So it's, uh, we have another 20 in production. So we're close to meeting our goal of 100 books this year. And uh, we're making them available, not just on the Describe and Caption Media Program channel, we're about to start up a, a, a podcast on Spotify. The Audiobook Wizard presents illustrated audiobooks. So uh, we'll make that free to everyone to be able to listen to these children's books with audio description of the pictures. And that's something that I remember when people first started asking me, Janine, when are you going to put your books on tape? Or when are you going to get your books as audiobooks and everything? And at the time that they were asking me this, which was around 2009, it was insanely expensive for somebody like myself, who was an independent published uh, author, to go into a studio, take the time to do all that. Talk to us a little bit about how you keep costs down for your crew, and yet you have these amazing high-quality books that come out of it well the fact that they're very short helps they're all under 15 minutes <laughs> that's right uh, under 15 minutes I, I forgot about that part yeah it's not like it's a eighty thousand word novel or something yeah. <laughs> so that that helps a lot and and also the fact that we have so many generous volunteers who are giving up their time that we end up only having to pay for the writing of the audio description by professional writers um, some of the audio editing, and we do pay our our blind and visually impaired narrators um, so they, they can earn some money too. Uh, but we keep the cost down. We can produce a video book and audio book version for $500. And that's it. And so we've been able to successfully do fundraising to cover the costs of uh, of these books. And what I loved was I was at an event down in Colorado Springs a couple of weeks ago called the 100 Authors Event. And the person that put it on was so jazzed to have you there that we got to actually see some of the new stuff you were doing with the American Sign Language uh, folks where these video books were being made available for those uh, children who were deaf. And so talk to us, how on earth did that ever transpire? I mean, did you kind of stumble into that? Talk to us a bit about that. Uh, really, you know, we started out just for uh, blind and, and visually impaired children. 
Um, we learned that low vision children um, like to see the pictures as much as they can while they're being described. So we actually started to do videos for blind children. I know that sounds insane, but uh, because so many of them have some vision and we are describing the pictures, what exactly they're seeing, that it really helps them. And then we said, well, we should add captions uh, in case any of the children uh, are deaf. And once we did that, we heard from the deaf community, would you be able to add sign language translation? Because there's so little content available for children ages three to eight who are learning sign language and children's illustrated books are perfect. So that's how, why we are now doing uh, both for the blind children and deaf children. What I found most impressive was as you get wrapped up your presentation on that, we had two people who, one, I had known for four years and did not know that she was one of those children. And she was crying because she was like, oh, my gosh, I've always wanted something like this. And then somebody else stepped out and said, oh, yeah, I have cochlear implants. And as a child, I was always asking people to assign to me what was happening in the books. And I, I was just blown away at how many people totally resonated with what your company was doing and what the organization uh, was doing for these children. And of course, you know, it was wonderful to see that people could actually sponsor a book or people could sponsor uh, an audio translation. So if you don't mind, share with us a little bit about how people can sponsor your organization. Yes. Uh, simply go to imaginationvideobooks.org. That's our website. And you'll see a donate button there uh, on the home page and also on our donation page. And when you click on that donate button, it breaks down for $500. You can sponsor an entire book, which means, you know, this book has been made possible by a contribution from Janine Bolin. You know, that type of thing um, is in the audio and the text. Uh, they can sponsor an audiobook version for $100 and or pay for captions, things like that. So imagination video books, plural, dot org is the website where they can find out all the information about how to support us. And we're also putting up a number of books that they can choose to sponsor. We'll have that up in the next uh, couple of weeks uh, so we can show people exactly the books that, uh, that they would be sponsoring. Well, we have about a minute left, and so what we're going to do is play a little excerpt for you, and then make sure you come back after the break, because we want to be able to share more with you with Richard Reinman and imaginationvideobooks.org. Hey, welcome back. I have with me today Richard Reinman, who is the founder organizer of the nonprofit group Imaginations Video Books. And before we bring Richard on, what I want you to do is this is the type of book that you have the ability to hear when you're with the Imagination Video Books group. What we have is a little clip from Alexander the Avoider. On the cover. In a room with a small tent pitched on a blue carpet, a boy lies inside on his tummy with headphones and a tablet, listening to music. Colorful musical notes fly in the air around him. The walls of his room are black and painted with white stars and planets. The title is Alexander the Avoider, a sensory processing disorder story by Nicole Philippone. Alexander was a little boy with a big spirit and an even bigger heart. He loved his mommy, daddy, and sisters very much, and he made sure to tell them all the time. Alexander lays on his daddy's back on a couch and hugs him around the neck. Alexander especially loved giving hugs and kisses, but not always receiving them. Sometimes he would get really anxious and push people away, even his mommy and daddy. Well, I know that that was pretty exciting. There's been a lot of talk about how we have so much technology available to us. Talk to us a little bit, Richard, about why we have books like this now. Talk to us about that history a bit. Well, in this clip, we, we just heard Alexander the Avoider. Um, 
It's a story about a little boy with a sensory processing disorder. So that's why he has trouble accepting hugs from people. And he has, you know, a, a sensory processing difference. And we are targeting books about children with differences or animals with differences. We, we have one about a fox who has cochlear implants and is worried <laughs> that, you know, she'll be made fun of by the other foxes. Um, so we try to do these relatable books, not just pure entertainment. I mean, some of them, like The Brave Little Crab that we do, are, are pure entertainment and, and very funny and entertaining. But some also have messages. Ricky the Rock That Couldn't Roll about a rock that had one <laughs> flat side and how his friends, other rocks, were trying to help him become a rock that can roll. I mean, just it's amazing how, you know, with these subtle messages, the differences are okay. Even invisible disabilities are okay. Um, we're trying to do video and audiobook versions of these kinds of heartwarming stories. So it's more than just pure entertainment, although that's fine. Um, we actually have a lot of books that have some very nice messages. And one of the things that I loved was when we first started talking, you and I, back in 2019, you were known as the audiobook wizard. Talk to us a little bit about where the wizard thing came from. Yes, the wizard thing, uh, you know, basically, <laughs> I have played a wizard character now in two video games, um, three books, three audio books. Um, so, uh, you know, plus some short children's books and it, it just, you know, I love Harry Potter and I, I so, I, the wizard voice just comes naturally to me and I find out that kids really like hearing it too. Um, so I, <laughs> that's what I'm using for, for my podcast and it, Gives me an identity of, you know, the, I talk about the magic of audiobooks uh, and, you know, the wizard uh, thing uh, helps. And I, uh, um, you know, that that's really where it came from. I'm an actor, uh, have been, you know, ever since uh, high school and uh, high school plays and and always a performer in front of a microphone. So it's been a lot of fun to take what I have done in radio news in my life and then audiobook narration and now lead into another way to uh, use voices to entertain uh, through the audiobook narration with description. And what I love is when we were for, you were first starting to launch this whole program, you were telling us of basically you're filling a gap that has 350,000 visually and hearing impaired young children in the U.S. And that your group is helping serve that community with books that would otherwise be totally unattainable by them. So talk to us a little bit about how you do that. Well, it's been so nice to have the recognition from the American Council of the Blind. They gave us a special recognition award for early children's literacy this year because no one else is doing this. It's uh, it's pretty unique. The National I'm going to pause you right there. You can't see it, folks. I've got my pom-poms <laughs> out, and I'm going, well done. Congratulations. We're going to put a pause just because, hello, pat on the back. Good job. Okay, please continue. I didn't mean Thank to interrupt. You. Thank you. And the National Association of the Deaf uh, has given us a grant to pay for the sign language of all of our videos. So they support it because, as I mentioned, there are just so few uh, books out there for children who are just beginning to read where they can see the the pictures, they can see the captions, and they can see the sign language interpreter all at the same time. So it really gives them a clear understanding of, of the books. And there are twice as many deaf and, and, and hearing impaired children as there are blind and low vision children in the U.S., so it is an important audience with a critical need. 
And one of the things that I wanted to let folks know is when you put your dollars into this organization, if you decide to donate to imaginationvideobooks.org, uh, I know the founder, I know where he lives. So you're, I know that the money is going to good things. It's not like this is a, some sort of a, a situation you have to worry about that where the money goes. And when we were first talking in January, there were only a few handful of books that you were able to get produced now with the grants and with all the support that you've received. How many books are you up to now? Yeah, we're up to, uh, let's see, about 75 uh, video books that have already been completed. Another 20 uh, are in the works. We'll have 100 by the end of the year. Um, so um, it, it's just um, we become a, a book publisher, in effect. <laughs> but, and who knew? That was really never a part of the game plan, was it? Right, right. <laughs> well, you have these amazing volunteers who are totally aware of the challenges that folks have when it comes to wanting to read stories, wanting to have stories, but the challenges of that. Talk to us a little bit about how they have shown up in your world. I mean, did they just show up on your doorstep and say, hand me a mic, I'm here for you? <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, you know, how do you get volunteers? Well, you know, I know a lot of people in the audiobook community, uh, having been in it for uh, like 12 years now. And the moment I approached some of the narrators, uh, you know, would you be interested in volunteering your voice for a children's book? I mean, I got Johnny Heller, who is one of the voices of the 20th century. He has done many children's books. Um, he did the Ricky, the rock that couldn't roll one. Uh, we've had, you know, wonderful top 10 in the country narrators volunteer their voices. And even some actors and actresses, Adrian Barbeau has done a uh, book for us um, of, uh, of Maud and uh, uh, what was it? The swamp creature or something fame. Uh, so Adrian <laughs> Barbeau uh, just loved what what we're doing. And I've been able to get board members who are on from the American Council of the Blind. I have a board member who's on the faculty at Gallaudet University, the School for the Deaf. I have a, a board member, uh, Joel Snyder, who's kind of the father of audio description. So some very important people have joined us in our mission and are spreading the word about it. Well, you very casually mentioned to me before we went on the air, oh, yes, and I'm thinking of doing a podcast. So talk to us about the podcast on Spotify and where people can find you. And when is that thing going to launch? Well, it is launching uh, next month in December. Uh, I don't have the exact date yet, um, but it will be the Audiobook Wizard Presents Illustrated Audiobooks, and we will play one 15 minute uh, book uh, e each uh, week. And, and, you know, bottom line is that this will make it available for all children, not just those uh, with who are blind or low vision, because you can listen to this in your car, you can listen to it on, you know, your Alexa app, you can listen to anywhere you can get a podcast you'll be able now to listen to it uh, through, uh, through the Spotify podcast we're, we're doing. Well, definitely let me know so I can put the link up on this uh, interview. And that way it will be at the com as well as on imaginationvideobooks.org. So if you don't mind, share with us a little bit about what are the goals for 2022? You've come further than you thought you possibly could in 20. Uh, 21. So, oh my gosh, what are the plans for 2022? Well, we have a few goals. I mean, ultimately, we want every children's illustrated book to be accessible. And for us to make that happen, we want the major book publishers, the Penguin Random Houses and the Harper Collinses and the Scholastics, to make their audiobooks, their children's books, accessible in audio. And we are uh, building a service arm to provide that service for them so they can create accessible audiobooks. Secondly, we're going to move to a third language. First language, English. Second language, sign. Third language, Spanish. We are going to start doing books in Spanish uh, in 2022. 
Well, all I can say is good luck, keep rocking, and I would love folks to be able to go and visit Richard Ryman's organization, imaginationvideobooks.org, and do that before the day is out so that you can see the quality work that is being done by my dear friend, as well as the many hundreds of volunteers that want to make these books accessible to others. Thank you so much for your work, Richard. Thank you, Janine. Thank you for listening to The Janine Boland Show. Be sure to subscribe to our show notes by going to the thejanineboland.show.com where you'll find additional resources as well as the opportunity to sign up to receive our program in your email each week. Be sure to visit our sponsor at the8gates.com. 